Here we are counting down toward the end and that's an exciting place to be. So this is the second half of chapter 15, our second chapter on and final chapter two on acids and bases. So we're at the point now where we're gonna bring in the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Okay, so Bronsted Two fellas, so they have both of their names attached to this. So you probably already realized it and could have come up with this on your own if you were a scientist back in the day. And I don't have a day for, I don't have a time period for Bronsted and Lowry, but they realized that really we could simplify an acid and a base definition by saying that an acid donates a hydrogen, whereas a base accepts the hydrogen. And that's it. So a base is always going to accept that extra hydrogen that's out there and the acid is always going to be giving and donating its hydrogen to the base. And you've already seen that. We just haven't really pointed it out in the way of Bronsted and Lowry. So what we want to really look at here is conjugate acid-base pairs. Well, I don't think, okay. Well, let's just look at a little bit of this acid donating. So we know that it's an H plus or H3O plus. The two are synonymous, hydronium and hydrogen ion. That's really what we're getting from that. And let's say we're going to put that with a weak base. So that's going to be ammonia is a weak base. And you tell me what's going to happen. You should be at this point able to say, well, H3O plus, let me move the plus over here, is the acid, so it's going to donate one of its hydrogens to the ammonia, and now it's no longer ammonia, it's ammonium with a plus charge. It's now a polyatomic ion, and what's left over after you take one H away is our hydroxide ion. Okay, so that's pretty easy, and we've been seeing that all along. But now we want to start thinking about conjugate acid-base pairs. All right, so we're going to do that with what we have on the board here. Um, can you find, when we say conjugate acid-base pairs, it means they're related, and they're related by hydrogen or not hydrogen being there. Otherwise, they're the same. So, where is our acid-base conjugate pair in this equation? Well, let's find two that are the same. Let's look at this and this is very much very similar except by one hydrogen. And so, we know that this is a base because it accepted an extra hydrogen. But now if we pair these two up, we know that that extra hydrogen now makes ammonium an acid. All right, over here. So these are two acid-base conjugate pairs. Now let's look at hydronium and hydroxide only. Uh, that actually isn't gonna work because if we, <laughs> we have to take two H plus now, now it works but not quite the same way. So we'll just deal with these being the acid-base pair, conjugate pairs. And it's under, it's really, let's see if we can find a few more. Maybe I can find a few more examples for us. Let's look at, well, it 
if we go back, actually what I'll do when we go through our homework, I'll bring this up and we'll be, we'll pick up the acid-base conjugate pairs as we do our class together. And that way you can talk about it and see it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's just so obvious what a conjugate acid-base pair is. All right. So with that, we are now going to move into the realm of buffers. Buffers. Okay, so I still think aspirin is a good thing to have on hand. They don't really promote it so much. They don't make much money off of it. Let me just say, you need to always be asking, what's the motive behind what they're trying to sell me? A lot of times it's money. But anyway, aspirin got a bad name back in the, somewhere in the 80s. They started saying, oh, it's associated with RISE, R-E-Y-E-S syndrome. And yes, it did seem to be implicated, but it went across the board and it wasn't that very much often. But guess who promoted that story? The Tylenol people did. Because guess what? Tylenol wanted you to be buying their product, which was not an aspirin-based product, but in a, a cinnamon, I can't even say the right, it's a totally different animal than aspirin. Cinnamon, I think is how you say it. And so Tylenol started really warning people about aspirin and don't take aspirin if you're sick. And if you get this or you get that, you need to take Tylenol and blah, 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 blah. Well, one of the downsides to aspirin in, in reality is that it's made of salicylic acid. You can get salicylic acid from willows. In fact, I think the Indians used to take a willow branch or a twig and they might chew on it to get some relief. Well, they were getting the salicylic acid and it's the salicylic acid, <laughs> an acid, that is giving you those reliefs that aspirin does. So Tylenol used that as well. But, before Tylenol came out, there was a company, a German company, that Bayern, um, they decided that they would buffer an aspirin. And that would not make it so hard on your stomach. If you take aspirin, it can upset the stomach. It can kind of tip the acidity of your stomach and make you uncomfortable. And it could not be, maybe over long term, if you had a lot of aspirin usage going on, it wouldn't be a good thing. So anyway, the the Bayer people came out and buffered their aspirin so that it would not have the same effect. So we want to talk about buffers. pH buffers. You know, there's a lot of buffers out there. And so you've probably run into that term buffer before. So now let's talk a little bit about buffers in terms of acid and base. So a buffer is something that you can add or already exist, as we're gonna see in the body. And when there's a addition of an acid, it's gonna minimize the effect on the pH change. It'll still go a little more acidic, but not nearly as much if the buffer was not there. So buffers tend to soften the blow of the addition of an acid or a base so that the pH change is minimized. Okay, that's really what we're gonna look at right now. And to start off with, let's talk about what a buffer is. Okay, a acid-base buffer is going to be either a weak, could be an acid, could be a base. It's not going to be both. It's going to be one or the other, but I want you to see that this is how it works. Plus, the salt or a salt. Let's just say there isn't the salt. There's many salts you could choose from. So let's say a salt of the acid and the base that you originally, the weak one, that you're using of the week. All right, so I know words don't ever really work well with me. I wanna see what you're talking about. So let's take a look at this and we're gonna use, we'll just use this one. 
We just actually kind of did this one. So you already know ammonia. Weak base or strong base? Now this is where we need to really kind of hone in on our skills of identifying weak versus strong. Because here, got to be weak for a buffered system. So I thought I would, I thought I had it ready. It, I just have to find it. Crazy how things kind of you get it all lined up and then it's gone again. Thought I had it. Put it over here. Here it is. So just kind of, I did this a couple of weeks ago, I believe. I'll do it over here in the corner. Strong acids. And strong bases. Again, you probably want to write these down, have them on a three by five card so you can kind of refer and get to know. Some of them you'll memorize after a while. Most of the strong bases are kind of easy because they come from either group one or group two and they're hydroxides. So calcium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and sodium hydroxide. Wow, that's pretty simple. Okay, so group two, group one, group one, group one. What's missing is magnesium. It's not even in there. We have strontium hydroxide. Obviously, if it takes two hydroxide, that must be in group two. That's in group two. These are all in group one. And then we have barium hydroxide. Now, if you really want to know, if you want to go a little bit step further, I was encouraging the elementary kids earlier this morning to ask questions. So my question is, why isn't magnesium hydroxide up there? Five bonus points, if you can look it up, write it down, you have to write it down, that explains why magnesium hydroxide did not make the strong base list. That's worth five bonus points. You won't hear it again, just text it to me and I'll put it in there for you. All right, strong acids are stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid. These are both halogens, chlorine and bromine. Hydrogen Iodoic, hydroidoic acid, there we go. Again, they're all from the same group. Those are from group seven, the halogens. Um, and now we'll move into our polyatomics, which would be nitric acid. Perchloric acid. And last but not least, the most popular acid in the United States for industrial purposes is sulfuric acid. So three are polyatomic ions and the other two come from group seven. So that may help you a little bit in terms of memorizing them and getting to know them. So beyond these, they're probably going to be weak. And that's really where we're dwelling. So let's get into finishing this off. We already know that's not on our list, so that's a weak one. All right, that's a weak base. And if an acid is added, so let's just put our hydrogen up there, we already know what's going to happen. We'll get the hydronium ion, and we got to put the salt in there. And so what's going to happen is... If you have your salt and it's going to match up, hydronium chloride is a salt, then when acid is added, it's just going to really make more hydronium chloride salt and minimize the change of the pH. On the flip side of that, if we have our salt from our weak base, and we add some base in there, hydroxide, then you probably already know what's going to happen. This extra hydrogen is going to go this way, and we'll have water plus 
a weak acid ammonia. All right, so if we're looking at acid conjugate base pairs, and we look at these two, we already did this. This one has more hydrogen, so it's acid. This one's a base. Over here, base and an acid. Okay, the whole bottom line is it is just going to minimize the shift in pH when either an acid or a base is added. Okay, so when does this actually happen? Oh, the sneeze coming on. Well, let's clear the board and talk about situations in our book that are talking about this buffer system. So I'll leave the buffer up there. One of the naturally buffered systems in your body is the blood system. Your pH of your blood has to be at 7.4. If it shifts much, either acidic or basic, from that, you are endangering your life. It's a very tight, narrow, um, I think it's 6.8, any lower than that, and even at 6.8, you might not be surviving very well. And the highest that you can go is 7.8. Both of these are going to be death. 7.4 is what your body is buffering the blood to so that when it does have a little extra acid, it's going to not change all that much. It might shift a little bit, but well within this parameter. So that's the blood parameters for pH. So how does this happen? Well, we already know that when you breathe out, the gas that you're breathing out is carbon dioxide, CO2. And carbon dioxide is going to react with the water that's already there in the blood. And when it does, it is going to make, eventually it is going to make H. H2CO3, which is carbonic acid, but then that is going to actually give one more hydrogen away and eventually you will get to HCO3 minus. And so what we have is we have a buffered system. And so these two right here are going to be our conjugate acid base pairs. Which one is the acid? The one with more hydrogen. So that's our acid, and this will be our base. All right. So when we take one of these, let's take hydrogen carbonate, and when hydrogen carbonate has acid added, it is going to make carbonic acid. And when carbonic acid has a base OH group added to it, that hydrogen is going to go this way, we will have water plus hydrogen carbonate. And again, the whole point of this is that you're not getting a shift of much change in terms of pH. All right, another situation in the book, other than blood. And by the way, this is really kind of what happens in terms of acid rain. We have carbon dioxide released in emissions. It's going to go through rain or humidity, and that is going to make... Eventually, it's going to get us to a carbonic acid. And it's this carbonic acid that eats away at marble and things like that. All right, a long time ago, I took a class that studied lakes. I'm telling you, there is a chemistry and there is a biology involved in a lot of things you would never have thought of. And so the study of lakes happens to be called limnology. And so in the study of limnology, across the United States anyway, they know that because of this acid rain, we have a lot of lakes out there 
that are in, I don't know what part of the United States, the northeastern United States that are very acidic. I mean, they're getting so acidic that, so we'll say northeastern lakes are running, some of them as close to 4.0. Now, that's very acidic. Even 5.0 is still pretty acidic when it should be what? It's water should be 7.0, right? So there's an acid problem in the lakes. But in the Midwest, the study of lakes reveals that there's not so much a pH problem we have more or less a 6.5, which is not very far from 7 and probably very acceptable. So the question is, why do our northeastern lakes run acidic, whereas our midwestern ones are very close, or getting a lot closer, are less acidic and closer to the neutral pH of 7? Well, what it is, is the midwest lakes have calcium carbonate. That is the salt of the weak acid, carbonic acid. Ah, and it's called limestone. And so when limestone has the carbon dioxide and the water from the rain or the acid rain, we can actually just throw the acid rain in there, I suppose, then what's gonna happen is we will have Let's just write in here. We can leave it right here, but we already know that that's going to make carbonic acid, H2CO3. So what's going to happen is one of these hydrogens is going to come over here. That's a salt. That's a weak acid. So that meets the definition of a buffer. And what we'll have is... Now really what's going to happen, we're, we're not looking at the metal part of the salt. We're really just looking at what's happening with this part. So that hydrogen went this way, and so now we've got a little bit of a neutralization happening with our lake system. So if we take this hydrogen carbonate, and we add some more acid to it, we're going to get, that's really pretty interesting, water H2O plus CO2. Wow. And so again, the bottom line is that a buffer minimizes the effect on a change in acidity or, base, or basic or alkalinity. Now the other application that's talked about is your stomach. And I don't know, you're pretty young. People that are getting a little bit older tend to have more issues with their digestive system for whatever reason. But the hydrogen chloride or the hydrochloric acid that's in there tends to really get going pretty well and can begin to either climb up the esophagus and that's that's not good that's heartburn that'll burn through the mucus layers of the esophagus but even in the stomach when there's a lot of acid it's like let's let's tone this thing down so a lot of times with the stomach acid um, you would take an antacid and there's different kinds of antacids out there We'll say that my husband's favorite because he seems to have a lot of this. I might have one every now and then, every two or three months, maybe, I don't know, maybe not even that much. He, on the other hand, really eats that stuff. Okay. So you will find some that go with the weaker bases like aluminum hydroxide. Or, and here's our weak one, magnesium hydroxide. We don't know why it's weaker, but it's weak. And so we can see that some of those forms are used. This happens to be milk 
<laughs> of magnesia. I met that when I was pregnant the first time and was getting heartburn, and you don't just take anything when you're carrying a child. And milk of magnesia was the one thing I could go for, go to for, there was a ton of heartburn involved with that particular situation in my life where I was carrying a child. And so I got to know it was my friend. I kept a bottle with me all the time. Um, magnesia is one of those things that you tend to not have a lot of in your body. So again, milk of magnesia might be a good way to go because you're getting the magnesium that you need as well into your body as well as toning down some of the acidity. On the other hand, we can go the carbonate route. So these are all going to be based on carbonates. And we have a calcium carbonate magnesium carbonate, sodium, and we also have potassium hydrogen carbonate. And th these can be used. Again, it's this part that is going to be the buffer. It's going to set up that buffering system so that you can minimize it. So if we take one of these, calcium carbonate, we add our acid, which is in the stomach, hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid. We are going to get calcium chloride, there's your salt, and we'll get some hydrogen carbonate. Just carbonate. Okay, so again, here's a salt, and here is a weak base. Okay, so again, the definition of a buffer is a weak acid and it's salt in the system or a weak base, and it's salt in the system. All right. So, I have a link at the bottom that says titration. So I found somebody that did a titration online. It was already there. And I want you to watch that. Another five-point opportunity will be at the very end for you to calculate what is the molarity of the unknown, or what is the unknown molarity of that s system? Oh, okay. My phone's about to die, so I gotta plug it in. All right. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about titration. But you are gonna watch the video and you'll see it done. But then we're gonna do some math here on the board with the results of the titration. So titrations are used when you have an acid and a base and one of them you're not really sure about its molarity. So you have one unknown molarity, either acid or base, and one known molarity of an acid or base. They have to be opposites though. So you're going to combine the two drop by drop and she will show you it's very boring. Okay, the first, you know, probably the first three quarters of that video. Go ahead and watch it, try to follow it. We had a lab that we would do with droppers, not with the burettes like what she has, and you would begin to see it, but here's the point. You get your known solution, and you add an indicator that's going to change colors at the point you needed to change colors. So let's say you needed to change color around seven. She uses phenyl phthalein, which I don't happen to have. I ordered it and it came in dry and it didn't tell me how to mix it and I've never had any good fortune with that. But anyway, you have to use an indicator and it's all about a color change. As you begin to take your unknown and drop, 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 you're going to see in the video as it goes on that the drop will make it go pink for just a minute and then the pink dissolves. Well, it's really 
changing in that one area, but once it all gets distributed, the pink goes away. And, it, and the longer the pink stays, the slower you want to add the titrating solution because the minute one drop makes the pink persist and it does not go away, that's when you're going to make your measurement for the volume. Okay? So watch the video. You can watch it a couple of times. I think it's about eight, a little over eight minutes. Uh, but you will definitely see how it's done. But let me get to the mathematical part and explain that a little bit. So there's a nice little equation that will help you solve the mystery once you know the volume. All right. So it goes like this. Your book doesn't really do this, and I don't know why it doesn't. M is for molarity. Molarity times the volume of one known substance equals the molarity times the volume of your second substance. So let's just say this is your known acid. And this one is your unknown molarity base. Okay, so we really don't know what its molarity is, but we're using in that one, she's using hydrochloric acid. So she knows exactly the volume she started off with. She knows exactly what the molarity is. And in the video, that is going to be the solution that she is going to put the indicator in. And then she's going to use the burette and fill it up with our unknown molarity base. And the whole reason she's doing this is once she adds enough of the base, so this is the acid, because it's known. This is the base, because it's molarity is not known. We know what acid it is, we, or base it is. We just don't know what the molarity is. And so once this is, let's say she started at the top, and when, it, when the pink persists down here, she's at a pH of 7, she stops. She's going to read how much was used from the starting point to the end point, that's called the end point. The end point is when the color of the indicator persists. And here's the deal, one drop. That's why when you get close to the end point, the color's starting to stay a little bit longer and then it disappears, you'll, you'll understand once you watch the video. Then you slow it down because you gotta start drop by drop because it's just one drop that's going to make this persist. Once you get there, you measure what that amount was and that'll give you your volume. Okay, so in this situation, so that'll, that'll, that will give you the volume. And the whole point of this was to find out what the volume is because you already know mathematically if you have everything there except one is missing, you can solve that mathematically. And that's the whole point. Once you find out what the volume is to bring it to the end point, now we can calculate for the missing molarity. So here we go. This is how it works. So let me get rid of this stuff. We'll leave this up here though. So I want you to see how this works. So she started off with let's just say hydrochloric acid. And she knew that it was a molarity of 0.1. So we put 0 0.100. Normally, three significant figures is pretty much where you want to go. And in this, she had 199 milliliters. 
Now, if it's milliliters over here, it must be milliliters over here. <coughs> we don't know what the molarity is while we're doing this, but when we're done, we find out that it took 20 milliliters of the base. And if you calculate that, 0.1 times the 19.9, it's gonna move the decimal over one, and then you're gonna divide that by 20. Let's see what you come up with. <coughs> you're gonna come up with a molarity, the unknown is now known, of 0 0.0995, and go ahead and put your capital M in there, because now you've solved the unknown molarity. All right, so we'll do a few of these problems in class so you can kind of get the feel for this. It's really easy, chem it's really easy math. Um, I give you three of these and you figure out the other one, you multiply this, divide it by that, and there you are. Pretty simple. So the whole point is for you to understand titration. So read it in the book, watch the video. Hopefully what I have said gives you a little bit of understanding. It's all about finding the missing or unknown molarity of either an acid or a base. Okay, so it could have been an unknown molarity of the acid and she's gonna put her known base. It doesn't matter. It's just gonna give you the information you don't know. So that's all what titration is all about. I think, oh, I did wanna go. <laughs> did look downstairs and where is it let's go back to the stomach before i leave you um in your book on page 536 under the picture of the stomach it says fact of the matter an alternative approach to controlling the acid indigestion is now available in over-the-counter medication. These drugs work by decreasing the secretion of acid in the stomach. These drugs were previously available only by prescription for people who suffer with severe acid indigestion or who have a tendency for gastric ulcers. All right, that doesn't really mean a lot to you. And here's the product they were talking about. Zentac. What do you know about Zentac? Oh, it's all over the news. Five bonus points if you can tell me. Wow, that's three today. If you can tell me what's the deal with Zantac and why is it all over the news, you tell me. Until then, I'll see you on Thursday. Um, happy chemistry working problems and all. And we're done with acids and bases. Hurrah. Next week, we will start in hydrocarbons. That is a totally different animal. I hope you look forward to the change. See you on Thursday. Bye.